Okay, hi everyone. My name is David Pacheco. I'm an engineer at Joint, and I'm going to be talking today about MDB, now more than ever. The genesis of this title is that I think a lot of us who work around the operating system or in the operating system think of MDB as something that's like pretty much baked and isn't something that's under active development. And I think we also take for granted the, um, the differentiators, what makes it so unique among um, the class of debuggers. And I was talking to Brian about this last week, and he's like, you know, if you ask Scott Hammond, CEO of Joint, what are the top features of SmartOS that make it a, you know, a unique platform for people to run their software, MDB is going to be in the top couple. And I was like, okay, like I, I wouldn't have known that. But sure enough, we actually tested this, and we were like, hey, Scott, what are the top features of SmartOS? And it was like ZFS zones, MDB, Dtrace, and like he went on, but like MDB was number three. So it's definitely a big thing for us. I mean, partly for us because a lot, a lot of our customers are running Node.js and um, we do Node.js support, and we did a lot of Node.js support for MDB, but it's definitely an important thing for people using the platform that um, with just this whole ethos of, of debuggability, which I'm going to be talking about. So how many people here, I just want to get a sense of the room, how many people here use MDB on a regular basis? Okay. Um, and how many of those, I think I actually might know the answers for all the follow-up questions, because I know most of you. So most of you are doing some kernel, some kernel work with MDB, right, on a regular basis. How many people are doing user land work with MDB? on a regular basis. Does anybody use it for Node.js by any chance? <laughs> Brian? Um, does anyone here work with Node.js but just like doesn't use the MDB stuff? All right, cool. Um, and also in the room, um, how many people are, you can answer yes to both of these questions. How many people are developers as opposed to ops people? And how many people, okay, developers? And how about ops people? Obviously a lot of people do both, so just, yeah. <laughs> yes. Okay. Yeah, why wouldn't you? What, what I'm getting at with that is it, I, I realize that a lot of the talks today are about using Illumos, but not necessarily developing on it. And you might have a different perspective on MDB from that perspective. Um, OK, so MDB is the modular debugger for Illumos. And I'm going to be talking about, I want to go through the history first and then get to where we are today with it. Um, so this was actually before my time at Sun. Fortunately, Brian was able to dig up some primary sources and tweeted it last week. So there's definitely some interesting material out there. Before MDB, so we're talking basically 1998 and earlier. Um, there was ADB, which was the uh, advanced debugger from SVR3, and there's Crash from SVR4. ADB is, um, is very primitive. It has the, the basic ideas of a debugger that you would need. You've got, you've got the nouns and verbs. You've got memory addresses and operators that let you dump that out, and you can use macros to print out, uh, to build more sophisticated things, um, but still very primitive, a little bit unreliable, sometimes crash printing stack traces. Um, Crash was something that's, it had support for more comprehensive things. Um, famously, Jeff Bonwick added KMA users to Crash, which is a command that showed uh, users of the kernel memory allocator, so you get a sense of, of that usage from a Crash dump. But it wasn't designed from the start to be extensible, and that it was a little bit unwieldy to make changes like that. Um, so at the time, okay, so the tools are primitive, unreliable, or incomplete, and there's a catalyst for a new debugger, which is also that we needed 64-bit support, and that wasn't present in these tools. And at that point, and it wasn't clear that the right path was to improve those tools as opposed to create a new debugger. So um, in 1998, Mike Shapiro starts work on MDB, ultimately integrates in August of 1999, and shipped in Solaris 8. MDB was born as a post-mortem kernel debugger. So there, there are a couple of axes here. There's kernel and user land, and there's both, both post-mortem and live. So by postmortem, I'm talking about, for user land, I'm talking about debugging a core dump as opposed to a live process. For the kernel, I'm talking about crash dumps as opposed to the live kernel. And when you're working on, uh, well, I'll get to some of the trade-offs that applies later, but um, two really important cho design choices for MDB were the ADB compatible syntax, which was important, particularly given the way MDB use spread within Sun, which is very organic. Some engineers start using it, other engineers see them start using it, so they start using it. It really helps when the syntax is completely backwards compatible with the thing you already know. Because at that point, it's like, why not use the new thing that also has new features, um, and you don't have to like relearn anything in order to use it. The other piece is the C API for extensibility, and this allows you to go build new um, pieces of software that, um, that also ship tools for debugging them. So as an example, if you look at SVC Start-D in Illumos, SVC Start-D has its own MDB module that delivers its own commands for the debugger that walk uh, certain structures that are specific to Start-D. And we also do this for things like libumem. And it sort of up-levels the idea of debugging as something you can ship with the software. 
and many of the tools that are built that way can only really be done in the same language that the system itself is implemented in. Obviously, other debuggers exist that have macro languages, and that's fine, but if you look at sophisticated tools like FindLeaks, FindLeaks is a MDBD command that is shipped with libumem, which is a memory allocator, replacement for malloc, among other things. And FindLeaks basically does a postmortem garbage collection on a C program to find leaks. So it looks for allocated references from the heap that are not referenced anywhere in, um, in thread stacks or in the heap or in global variables. Those are things that are probably leaked, and it's able to print those out. That's not that easy to do with, some, with like a macro language. You kind of need to be able to do that at the level of C, and that's an important design choice for MDB. So looking over, taking the whole thing overall, the organizing principles behind MDB, the, the, I, the way I like to think of this is that the emphasis is on printing and summarizing complex state. And that's very different than a lot of other debuggers. A lot of people, when they hear the word debugger, they think something under which I run my program and I can set breakpoints and I can set conditional breakpoints and I can print out local variables and I can print out source code and stuff like that. And that's great. The MDB can do some of those things, not all of those things. Um, but the genesis of MDB was different. Remember, it was a postmortem kernel debugger. The kernel is a very complicated system, first of all. So this, there's this idea of complex state. State is complex. You have processes, threads, zones, files, um, sockets, interfaces. Uh, I mean, you can just rattle off tons and tons of objects in the operating system, and they're all comp they have complicated connections to each other. So it's important to be able to summarize that in a useful way. So an engineer walking up to a, a problem, like a crash dump, can quickly say, what are the processes running on the system? Or what are the ZFS pools that are configured here? How many IOs are going on here? It's more about being able to capture that state very efficiently and answer complex questions about that state than it is to be able to control that state. Um, MDB has grown the ability to inspect the live kernel as well as live user land processes and processes from core dumps, although that happened later. And to me, the emphasis is still on, on this idea of defining commands to gather that state. Uh, I talked about the first class module API, and I basically talked about all this stuff. Okay, so um, how many people here have never seen MDB before at all? Okay, so I'm just gonna actually just do a little demo to show what some of these things look like. So I'm logged in here. Can you guys see this text if I like, is that text big enough? So I'm logged into a SmartOS VM running on my laptop, and I'm in the global zone, and I'm gonna run MDB and attach it to the live kernel, not in writable mode, because I don't need to do anything that fancy here. Just to give an example of, of sort of basic commands, there's a colon colon ps command, which looks obviously a lot like, yes. No, I have not. So what, what, the question was, have I halted the kernel right now? And the answer is no. Um, MDB has just basically attached to a device that allows it access to the kernel state. But the kernel's still running, and, and the, you know, there's no inter it's not running under the debugger either or anything like that. It's not like I've continued it or anything. Um, so I ran this colon colon ps command. Most of the higher level commands in MDB start with colon colon for historical reasons. Um, and this obviously looks a little bit like the PS output, and obviously that's intentional. Uh, this is kind of, this is a relatively high level command. It's built on some lower stuff like walk proc. So MDB has this built in notion of walkers where you use colon colon walk and then some type of object in the system. And you can also do, for example, threads. And it will just report all of the memory addresses for those things. So in the case of proc, it's printing out the proc T, which is a C structure for all of the processes on the system. For, doing, for walk thread, it's all the K thread Ts. And then you can pipe that to something else. So it has pipes as a built-in uh, idea. So we can do walk thread, pipe to find stack. And with that, so the find stack command takes threads on input and grabs a stack trace for each of those things. Um, I could do walk proc and I can act, well, this is, that's not that interesting. I can pipe that to PS. Um, I can also do pipe that to P files and get the files that are open in each one of these processes. Um, let's see. So another thing that's pretty cool about MDB is you can shell out to the actual Unix shell to do summary commands, and I use that pretty heavily. So if you just want to count the processes on the system, you can just pipe that to WC minus L. Uh, let's see, you can walk threads. And you can do um, somewhat more sophisticated things. So for example, uh, let's suppose you wanted a count of threads by, I don't know, zone name or something like that. You can do walk thread. I'm going to, so I'm gonna use colon colon print. So if I just print all of these things, colon colon print is a command that prints out the C structure of the thing that you gave it. And you have to tell it what type it is, of course, because it's C, it doesn't necessarily know what type that is. So that, that's fine. But you can also just use that to dereference something and follow pointers to something else. So the K thread T represents a thread. It has a pointer to its process. So I can follow the pointer to the process and get 
uh, pzone zone name. Proc PE, sorry. And so what I've done is I've walked all the threads on the system and printed out the zone name for each one. And then I can pipe that to sort unique minus C, sort minus N. And I very quickly answered kind of a complicated question based on these primitives. So it looks a lot like the Unix philosophy in this way that you have these primitives that operate on, there, there's walkers and there's commands that operate on objects and you can combine these with a pipe and you can also shell out to the real uh, Unix shell. Does that all make sense so far? Cool. Um, so I've been talking about this idea of postmortem a bunch and I just wanna flesh that out a little bit more. If you've seen any of the slides that I've given or any of the talks I've given in the last couple of years, you've probably already seen this slide. I really like this quote. This quote is from Stanley Gill from a paper he wrote in 1951 I mean, talk about like the dawn of modern computing, and I use the term modern very liberally here. Um, and what he's basically, so this paper is called The Diagnosis of Mistakes in Programs on the EDSAC, and he's talking about something he calls the postmortem technique. The observation he's making here very euphemistically is this idea that like, I guess you have these problems where I guess if you looked at the code for a really, really long time, you could probably find them, I guess, but like pretty often it's actually worthwhile to investigate problems in code after you've run it and found that it doesn't work. Which is like, boy, is that true. I mean, that rings as true today as it did back then. And he goes on to describe it. This is a really interesting paper. It's very short and accessible, so I strongly recommend actually checking it out. But he goes on to describe this process that his process ends up being um, recording a lot of information while the program is running so that you can take a look at that information after it's failed and figure, it out, figure out what it did and what's gone wrong. We have much better ways of doing this, much more sophisticated ways of doing this today, but it's kind of evolved in a natural way. We talk about a core dump, a crash dump, right? This is a dump of all of memory, or as much of memory as makes sense for whatever that is. So for a core dump, you're talking about all the memory associated with a running program. What's really nice about it is that it's minimally disruptive. Um, there's no runtime overhead for doing this, right? If you take core dumps when a program crashes, um, you don't, it doesn't slow down the program when it's running. It just takes a few seconds after it's done. The other thing it does is it allows you to decouple the process of debugging a failure and root causing a failure from the process of restoring service. How many times have you, if you've, been, if you've ever operated a production service, how many times have you experienced the tension of saying, okay, the service is down right now. I could spend an unbounded amount of time, who knows, could be 10 minutes, could be an hour, could be many hours, figuring out what's wrong while the service is down. But I know I'd be able to root cause it and then we could solve the problem and never have to deal with it again or I can get the service back up, and I'm pretty sure I could do that if I restarted it, and it would just come back up. And it, it, there's always this tension, it's very difficult, and I don't mean to claim that this is a silver bullet, but this is a huge step in decoupling those things. Because what you can do is you can say, if I'm gonna restart the service, I'm gonna save a core file first, and I have all the state I might possibly want about that service. Uh, there's certainly some dynamic state that sometimes you, there's certain problems where you still want dynamic state, and it's not always the first thing you do, take a core and restart but it's a huge help, and the other thing is if there's anything that you wish you had about the program that it, doesn't, that it wouldn't currently have in a core dump, all you have to do to get it in a core dump is to keep track of that in memory. That's all you have to do, right? Because it'll be in memory, so then you can actually have it. Um, I, I could talk about this for another hour, all the different other benefits of this. I'm gonna try to do this quickly. Uh, one thing is that it's very comprehensive. You have all, I mean, how many times have you dealt with, uh, I haven't had to deal with this a lot recently, but certainly in my career, when you, see, when you have a problem that comes from a customer, the information you have is whatever the customer thought to tell you. And the information you have from a support person is often the information that they thought to ask. And that's not everything. And sometimes it's actually wrong. And uh, you know, particularly in some cases, we've had situations where that information was often not that reliable. And so we built in facilities to the software for gathering things like the versions of everything that is running right now and the configuration of everything that's running and an audit log, not, not a security audit log, just a log of the user actions that have been taken. And to get to the point where that was the best way of figuring out what had happened. You actually just go look at the audit log, see what they did, see what errors happened, and you have all this other information to figure out what's, what's up. So it's comprehensive, it's facts rather than people's interpretations. Oh, I'm running the latest. Well, is it the latest stable, the latest bleeding edge? Was it, the, was it an older version of the latest stable? Like there's all kinds of ambiguities in people's interpretations of data. This also allows you to solve the problem the first time, and that's actually, that's actually the root principle here. The idea that the first time we see a problem in the field, we wanna solve it then and there without having to see it 50 more times. We don't wanna to have to go through the cycle of 
here, I'm gonna give you a new version of the program, can you run it and, and reproduce it and give me more information about it? And every, you know, of course there's not enough information, you have to take another lap. By the time you take your sixth or seventh lap, it's like, it's kind of embarrassing. It, it looks like you don't know what you're doing. And, and it's hard, it's a hard problem, and sometimes you, you still have to do this, but to the extent you can maximize the amount of information you gather which you, with each of these laps, it's extremely val valuable. And the last point I wanna make is that as we talk about uh, the containerized world, the world of automated cloud-based infrastructure, buzzword, buzzword, uh, people are talking about servers being cattle, cattle not pets. The idea that you, you have a large uh, fleet of these things that you're managing systematically, not a whole bunch of one-off things with their own names that have been set up by individuals and things like that. And post-mortem debugging is debugging for that world of cattle rather than pets. It's treating this problem systematically. You know, some of our services are gonna crash sometime and we're not gonna just like treat all of those as one-off ad hoc events where we go log onto the box and figure out what's going on. Um, sometimes you have to do that, that's fine, but to, the, to a large extent, you can automate and decouple a lot of the root cause analysis. Okay, so that's kind of the background. That's, that's kind of the case for MDB and the ethos around MDB and postmodern debugging. So I wanna talk a little bit about some of the work done in the last five years, because I certainly thought of this as something that was pretty baked, and then I went back and thought about it and looked at some of this stuff, and there's actually been kind of a lot of work done. Here's a whole bunch of tickets. These are a whole bunch of features that have been added to MDB. Um, and obviously the, not, the goal here is not to show all those specific things. A lot of these are commands that have been added in support of work that's being done. So joint, we did KVM, um, we did uh, LXZ work that Patrick talked about, and al along the way we found, boy, it would be really nice if MDB had a tool for printing out this state from the kernel, so we go add that. Other people are doing the same thing. There's a whole bunch of ZFS enhancements that have been added here as well. So there's been a whole lot of new enhancement going on there, which is great. And then I wanna call out uh, five, five changes in particular that I think are interesting in their own right, people might not know about, and also reflect some interesting trends in the community. So the first one is just a usability thing, which is tab completion. And tab completion is one of these things that's like, okay, no brainer, I've said it, that's all there is to say about the feature in some sense. Um, but everyone I've talked to about it is basically like, tab completion in MDB changed my life. It's, it's, <laughs> ext it, it's extremely convenient, and that's certainly true. But there's a, there's a reason why it's more significant than that, which I think is that, particularly for me, as someone who doesn't do a lot of new code development in the operating system, but I do find myself pretty frequently debugging the operating system. I, you know, there's some subsystems I know pretty well because I've debugged them or worked in them in the past, but there's a lot of times that I'm debugging a subsystem I've never debugged before, and I don't know all that much about. And I've got the source up on one side, and I've got MDB up on the other, and it's always important to refer back to the structure definitions, but being able to do, you know, walk, oh, proc, okay, proc, print, um, proc T, is that what it's called? Of course, that one's pretty easy, but like, what are these fields here? It makes the system much more discoverable to someone who's debugging something that they don't already know. And the kernel's a huge piece of software developed by thousands of people over many, many years. You don't know the whole thing, and it's really valuable to be able to do that. So that, that's my pitch on why tab completion is even more significant than it seems like it is. Okay, programmatic support. These are a couple of features that I'm, I'm bundling under this notion of either automated or programmatic support, depending on how you look at it. Um, the first one is MDB minus E. MDB minus E, again, it's another one of these things that sounds super simple, and it is. MDB minus E is the idea of, uh, you could just give it a command here, and it'll run that and then exit right away. Which doesn't make much difference if you're just an engineer debugging a specific problem. But when you start saying, huh, this problem seems to have affected hundreds of machines, I wanna run this on a whole bunch of systems at once, or I wanna run this uh, across a whole bunch of crash dumps, this actually is pretty useful. So, we had a problem Brian was just talking about during the break um, where we've had this operational issue where we have a kernel task queue that starts getting really backed up and when this happens, it, it can be a long time before we've noticed that it's happened, but the system is on a gradual march to its death and as it gets there, things start getting really, really bad and our ops people are in this, you know, we, have, we got a fix last week, we haven't yet deployed it to production, so our ops people are still, they have to monitor for this condition and then reboot the box proactively when, when it happens. It's much nicer to be able to tell them, actually there's an easy way to check for this condition. All you have to do is to run mdb minus k minus e, task queue minus n, uh, debug evict. And so we also got a, a command within the joint public cloud that allows us to run a shell command on a whole bunch of nodes, which is very convenient, which means I can give the ops people this one thing and say go run that on a whole bunch of nodes periodically. You, you can definitely do the echo, pipe, MDB, blah, 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 blah. There are a couple of subtle differences about the way that works 
in ways that make it annoying, particularly if you want to automate it, because I forget which one it is, but one of these does, MDB does its business about line breaking wherever it thinks your terminal is, and that, makes, that actually makes it surprisingly more painful to deal with automatically. But the other thing is that when you give, um, it, it's just, it's easier to grok, and it's easier to give to people who are not necessarily as technical and maybe don't even know how to use MDB. So the other case where this comes up a lot is when we need to give support or operations a workaround, which, you know, we, we, it's not that infrequent that we have to give them an MDB minus K minus W invocation that's going to either change some kernel tunable, potentially change some program text in the kernel. We try not to do that very often, but sometimes we have to do it. It's, again, much nicer to be able to give them a one-line shell command that they can understand, they can tell whether it succeeded or not reliably, and, um, and it's just like, that's it. You don't actually have to understand how to use MDB. This is, it's, just, um, it's just a reliable way to do this thing. So anyway, that's MDB minus E. The other one is colon colon printf. This is work that Brian did. Um, there's the obvious, really useful thing of colon colon printf, which is, actually, let me just demo it. So earlier I did, I wish I had my history here. I did walk, let's do walk proc print proc t p user dot u p s args. This prints the arguments for all of the processes on the system right now. Um, obviously, it's kind of unwieldy. Actually, this is probably a bad example. Is this, is this gonna work with percent %s? <laughs> this is literally the first time I remembered to put the new line the first time I ran this command. Um, printf, percent %s, proc t, yes. That's a much nicer view. And, the, and if you wanted to do, for example, let's do, Oh, this is actually, there we go. It's, I mean, this, yeah, you can already see that this is incredibly useful, even just for humans. Like, it, we tend to, I think, second class the developer use case, because it's like, well, you're, you're a developer, you can figure out how to munch this stuff together. Um, and it's true, obviously, but it's still really useful to be able to quickly generate like a useful human-readable report, stick that in a bug report. But there are also certain use cases that um, that this enables that are really surprisingly hard to do any other way. So the example I usually like to use is, um, suppose I wanted to print the PSRGs for processes in a specific zone. Obviously, if I were running on the live system, I could use pgrep minus z. MDB actually has a pgrep, but it doesn't support minus z. But even if it did, I could, I could change this so it's like, suppose I want to print vdevs from a specific pool or something like that. This, this pattern comes up a lot, and I'm just using processes and zones because, um, be, because that's one that is easy to demo and people pretty much already understand the abstractions. So what I, would, what I could do is I can walk proc, print proc t p user, no, p zone, zone name. But now I just have the zone names, and I don't know what the proc t is, right? And so I can't go back and get, for example, the ps arc. So I can, like, I can grep for my other zone, but I don't actually have the proc T anymore. So print, colon colon printf is really useful for this because I can print both of these things. I can print dot as one of the things. And now these are the pointers to the proc T's. And that naturally lends to another useful thing. So I'm going to not just, I'm gonna grep that zone and print just the pointers. Ah. So now I have just the pointers to the proc T's. What I'd really like to do next is actually take that and pipe that back to colon colon print proc T P user PS args, say. There's no way to directly do that. You can redirect it to a file and then you can colon colon cat C, which I only discovered like three years ago, which is amazing. Colon colon cat is extremely useful. Cat, so C is just the name of the file I gave it. And then I can do print proc T P user, what did I say, U P S args, fine. So that's, but if you try to do that without colon colon printf, it's surprisingly painful. If someone else has a good way to do it that doesn't involve colon colon walk proc p, I know how to do it that way, that's really annoying, and it's really hard to explain to someone else how that works. Um, but if, there are other ways of doing that that I'm, I'm interested in that. Anyway, just as an aside, something I wanna talk about for future work, what we'd really like to be able to do is take this thing and actually bang that back into MDB. So have bang go back from the shell back to MDB. Great hackathon project if anyone wants to do it. <laughs> Please, it would be so nice. Okay. Um, and the, th the third category of improvements that I wanna talk about from the last couple of years are, are what I'm calling broader application support. And this shows up in a couple of ways, particularly for us at Joint because we've been doing a lot of work with LXZ. Um, 
we're dealing with a lot of user applications that don't have the debugging information that MDB needs in order to print C structures. So in MDB, you can print C structures, right? You give it a pointer and you say, print that as a SIG info T or something like that. And that works because libc or the kernel, whichever one you're debugging, has the type information for SIG info T. And the way that works is that when we build those, those components, we build them with dwarf debugging information, and then we run a pass using the CTF tools that looks at the binary, pulls out the dwarf, converts it into a much more compact form called CTF, and jams that back in the binary. So the binary doesn't actually have all the dwarf information, it's nice and small, but MDB still has all the type information. And it's possible to do this for your own programs, but it's pretty unwieldy. The tools for doing that are not in any like public package or anything on GitHub or anything like that, so it's kind of annoying. And of course, in the Linux world, nothing has that. Like we're, We can't actually change the build process for all the Debian packages. So, uh, but. That said, there are a lot of Debian packages that have, there are debug versions of packages that do have the dwarf support in them. So the question is, well, can we actually just have MDB pull out the dwarf information when you open the core file? And the answer is yes. This is something that Robert did very recently, Robert Mostaki, and it's amazing. Um, it's, it's, so, it's, like, it's very simple in concept, but it's actually amazing that it just works. So I have a simple example of that if you haven't seen this. This is, this is a very simple program. Uh, it's really just a toy demo. I have a struct here that I've defined that represents a timestamp, and I just have a couple different representations of the same time. And my program in main, I just populate it with a time, and then I populate the other fields, and then I call print time. And print time just prints out the string representation and then calls abort, so I get a core file. So I'm gonna big build that, and I build both the debug and non-debug non thing. And I'm gonna run the debug version. Ad aborts right away, as expected and I'll use, actually use colon colon stack to get a stack trace. So here's main, so here's the function I called. And if I, of course, if I print my timestamp t, that's not gonna work. And the, so this new functionality is off by default, but if you specify libproc ctf convert to any value, <laughs> and I take that exact same thing, all of a sudden I actually have a structure representation of my data which is amazing. Again, I, I can't emphasize how frustrating it is to deal with a, a binary that doesn't have any of this information and how amazing it is when you previously didn't have it and now do. This is really awesome. Before we had this, as kind of a step along the way, there's a, and this is still useful for some cases where you don't actually have the dwarf information either, there's, uh, there's a colon colon type def command that Robert added. So it's got very good documentation. And the basic idea here is you're gonna just tell MDB about various types. So I have, I've already done this for this program. I've, I've got this command here, colon, colon, type def, and then I just define it right there. So this takes a little bit more effort because you have to manually do that. It can't quite just parse a header file, but you can do that and then once again, this should work. And once you've done that, you can actually, uh, you can type def minus w to some file, which I've now misspelled. Also didn't work. Right. And then I can open in a new session. I can do type def minus r type defs. And again, this should work. But again, if I did it without that, it doesn't work. So type def minus w and minus r are also extremely useful for those cases where, where you're like, I just, I really need this debugging information, I'm desperate, and I'm willing to basically massage it into this format. The other piece of this, what I'm calling this broader application support, where basically this, this is this whole um, class of use cases where we're applying MDB to more types of software than we previously did, is this Node.js and Go support. So I worked a lot on the Node.js support, and I'm gonna talk about that a little bit. Um, and the Go support, I don't know very much about. I know that we did it a couple of years ago at Joint, and it works for 1.4, and it allows you to print things like Go routines and certain Go values. And my understanding is it doesn't work with 1.5 anymore. Uh, it's kind of fallen a little bit by the wayside, but it's, it's, it was still a good, it was still necessary for the 1.4 support, which ironically is still necessary for 1.5 because of the bootstrapping thing. So that's actually still pretty critical. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the Node.js stuff. So um, Node.js, dynamic runtime environment, JavaScript on the server, Joint was the Node.js company for a while. It's still a big Node.js company. All of our software is in Node.js that's not in the operating system. I think that's a pretty accurate statement. Certainly all the services that we build, all the Upstack stuff is built in Node.js. It's pretty clear that we needed some uh, post-mortem debugging support for Node.js, which is crazy. I'll explain why that's crazy in a minute. 
But the example where this happened was like three months after I joined Joyent. We were launching a cloud analytics service. Brian and I actually talked about this at Surge 2011, I think. We had this problem where like, like 20 minutes after we put it into production, one of the data aggregators just starts spinning 100% on CPU in user land doing no system calls at all. And so we've got like Ryan Dahl there who wrote Node, we've got Brian, obviously a lot of operating systems knowledge, wrote Dtrace, I wrote the program with Brian and Robert, and none of us had the slightest clue where in this Node program it was. Because what MDB can tell you is that it's running instructions, it's running these instructions over here, but those instructions were created by V8, which is the VM, the JavaScript VM underlying Node, and it just like splats them into memory. And, and normally MDB looks at the instructions and maps that back to the symbol table and says, okay, that's function, whatever. But for, for dynamically generated JavaScript, you don't have that. So uh, we, there's just no way of knowing where it was. But we knew that this was an important problem. Of course, we didn't actually see that problem again for like eight months until Brian was demoing in front of an investor. Naturally, that's, that's how it happens. It's actually a good example of why just because something is rare doesn't mean it's not important. And it's not just because of the investor. I mean, obviously that could have been not an investor, but it's just these problems can be devastating even if they're rare. It doesn't have to be reproducible to be a severe problem. So that's why this, this postmortem thing is really useful. The two major use cases, just to reiterate, are the fatal failures in the case where a node program throws an exception that's not caught. So I modified V8 to support this abort on uncaught exception flag which literally does that. So if, if the node program was gonna throw something, like you tried to access some property of an object that's non-existent, the object is null, it'll, it would have th dumped a stack trace and exited six or whatever. Now it calls abort, we get a core file, we have the actual stack, including the native stack, we have the JavaScript values that are arguments to functions on the stack and we can print all those things out. And the other one is G-Core. So you can G-Core a program that's misbehaving, and misbehaving here is very broad. It can be returning 500s, it can be behaving very slowly, it can be having a memory leak, anything that's wrong but the program, but it's not fatal. This is the classic case, we walk up to a production service that's pitching 500s because it's disconnected from some backend thing because it didn't reconnect properly. We can save a G-Core of that thing and restart it and decouple the root cause analysis from the rest restoration of service that I was talking about. Um, I just want to do a quick demo of this, and hopefully this is interesting even if you're not super into Node because it has implications for what, what would be interesting to see in MDB in the future separately from just for Node. Uh, okay, so let's see. I have a core file here. Actually, I'm gonna do... This is a core file from a component that I work on called the job supervisor. So we run this Manta object storage service, which is basically put get deletes of arbitrary byte streams, and then compute is baked into that as a first class thing. So you can run grep on an object that you've stored in Manta, which is our object store, and we'll go like run grep on all of the objects that you asked us to run on. Uh, the job supervisor is the component that does that, although it's not actually that relevant to this example. So I'm gonna load the latest version of this module. Now, if you, do, if you run stack again, this is what you see, which is an awful lot of garbage. So you've got the libc call to abort, you've got the C++ runtime, or rather the V8 runtime C++ code, and then you've got all these addresses, these are just addresses of JavaScript functions that V8 has just stuck in random places in memory. If you run JS stack instead, you get a much nicer output, although it's still a little bit cluttered by these internal frames. Uh, which shows you the function name, the JavaScript function name. So we actually, we went from, we're in node main, and then we call into libuv, we call back into node, and then we go into JavaScript, and then we go back through native code and go back into JavaScript and back into native and go back and forth a bunch of times. We can get a little bit more information with minus v, which shows us that where we are is we're processing tick callbacks in, in node, and we're in nodes net.js, line four, 439, in an anonymous function, and then we have this emit function. And actually, let me get rid of the minus n zero. And we actually have the source code for all these functions, which is pretty cool. Um, and we can take, uh, let, me, let me go back to the vn zero. We see that we're emitting an error, so I'm just, I can take this and I can print it out. And this is actually the JavaScript error object, and we can see that, okay, we got an econ reset on a socket as part of a read operation. I'm gonna kick off this operation that takes a few seconds and then I'm gonna come back and explain what it's doing. Um, so just a quick note on why this is so tricky if it's not clear. Um, I already mentioned that the idea that MDB basically has no idea about any of the V8 internal structures. So we had to basically encode all that information in the, in the debugger module. So some of it is just, okay, we have to basically re-implement part of the VM inside the debugger, which is, 
it, it has its pros and cons. I, certainly, I don't think the solution we have is the ideal solution to the problem, but I don't know of any other solution for postmortem debugging in dynamic environments at all, so it's, it's, and it's extremely valuable, so it is what it is at this point. The other thing that's tricky and a little bit subtler is that particularly in languages like JavaScript, there's not always a way for the user to even ask a question of a debugger that they want the answer to. So as an example, in JavaScript, you're often in a situation where you have an outer function and an inner function, and the inner function has access to variables from the outer function. It's called a closure, right? And what the user wants to know is what was the local variable in the outer function when that inner function was defined? And it's like, there, that's not, like in C, you can almost always find a pointer to something on a stack or from global state somewhere. You have a unique name for most things or you can follow from a unique name to some set of pointers. But in JavaScript, that's just not, not true at all. And so we, you need, we needed a way to be able to ask questions about the debugger, from the debugger that are not based on globals or things that necessarily are built into the language. Hopefully this thing is done now. So what I just showed, what I just ran was find.js objects. Find.js objects is something that scans all the memory in the core file and looks for things that seem to be JavaScript objects and then classifies them by basically duct type. So it looks at the properties of each object and, and buckets them and now we, and gives you a line of output for each class of object and a representative object, the number of objects that look like that, the number of properties it has, et cetera and I can take one of these values and print it out. This is an example of what I'm talking about. The user might know, oh, I have an object somewhere that has a property called no cache, and I'm really interested in its value, but I, I don't know how to actually tell you where it is. Well, it's like, well, well, we'll build a way for you to query objects by their property, or you can query them by their constructor name. More recently, we built something called JS functions, which shows you these closures that I was talking about. Um, and I just wanna pick, pick one that's kind of interesting. So we can take one of these functions. So what JS functions does is it lists all the functions in your program and shows you how many closures of each one you have. And again, gives you a representative one. So we can take this function. So this is a function inside the bunion logging library. Notice that we're in this make log emitter function where we define a make record function. So that means every time we call make log emitter, a new instance, a new closure for make record is created. And they all have potentially a different value for the log variable and any other local, and also for min level. So any other local variables that are there. And we can actually take that um, and print out colon colon JS closure and that will show us the values of all those variables. So let's see, I just printed JS closure. We, it has a log that, that it had. It had a reference to a make record function, fields, and MSG args. These are other variables that were defined in the outer function. Uh, okay, this has also been very useful. This is also particularly useful for understanding memory leaks because when you leak memory, uh, oftentimes you'll either have a very large number of some kind of object or you'll have a surprisingly large number of some kind of closure for some specific function. And then the latter means you also know somewhat where it is, which is really nice. Okay. So a couple of notes about the MDB V8 implementation. First of all, a constraint that we have on this implementation from our perspective is that this must work with absolutely no support from the process itself that's being debugged. This is just a first principle for us because you can have crashes in C++ code in the process. You can have crashes even in libc, right? You can have crashes in V8. Or you might just wanna be able to take a core file at some arbitrary point of execution. Maybe you're using dtrace to stop the process when it opens a particular file and you wanna see what the state is there, not a few seconds later after the VM has written out its own heap dump. So this is what makes the problem so hard because most VMs are not built under the assumption that something else is going to want to grok the internals of the VM after that process is gone. Um, in order to do this in a way that's not incredibly brittle, we really didn't want it to be the case that the debugger just encodes all the offsets of all the structures and, all, and on the layout of all these structures um, in, in the debugger itself. So it's somewhat parameterized. This is a whole complicated mechanism and for time I'm not gonna actually go into it, but Definitely let me know if you're interested in that later. Suffice it to say, we, we modified the V8 build process to take advantage of some crazy stuff they're doing with macros that generate getters and setters for these things to generate our own metadata. We bake that into the binary and the debugger reads that metadata out of the binary so that if, you know, if someone adds a field to V8, this doesn't just totally break. If they change the algorithm for how property iteration works, then it does break and we have to go deal with that. In terms of what's missing here, so to be clear, this has been extremely useful for us already. I mean, we've just, we've, We've root caused tons and tons of fatal failures and non-fatal failures and memory leaks and all kinds of things using this technology. What's not really possible today, there are a couple of things that are missing. What's not really possible 
is to write modules for specific node programs, which would be really nice. You know, I work on a particular thing, which is this job scheduler. It would be nice if I could write a little debugger module, and ideally not even in C, because this doesn't really require C, and that would be, it's sort of not the right level of abstraction for this, that would just enumerate from JavaScript objects that it already knows about, uh, outstanding jobs, outstanding tasks for each job, outstanding requests and things like that. And there's not really a good way to do that today because we're already using the module idea for MDB V8 itself. The other thing is the translation from jitted addresses to function names that I showed is, is pretty manual, right? I showed that we have colon colon JS stack, but $C still shows the wrong thing. Colon colon stack still shows the wrong thing. If you have a memory leak that you find in find leaks that has like native code, native code, JavaScript code, native code, the JavaScript code does not have the function names in it. You can get the function names, we have manual ways of translating it, but it would, it would be nice if that happened automatically. And just thinking about this talk a couple weeks ago, it, it, it just, I realized that it would be useful if MDB had a, some higher level interfaces for the module API, to, so, so that a module API, for example, could, a module could express, hey, I know how to translate certain constants into symbolic names, and, and provide a callback function for doing that, or specify a table for doing that, for example. Other things that might be useful are, I know how to, I can expose certain objects which have certain classes or types or something that have certain properties that can be followed in this way, and just leverage the existing colon colon print stuff so that we don't necessarily have a colon colon JS print. And it's just because it's a pattern that we've seen come up a bunch within MDB V8, and uh, it, it's somewhat challenging to re-implement that functionality. Anyway, um, the next thing I want to talk to, I know I'm a little bit short on time, but uh, I'm just going to jam this in. Okay, cool. Sweet. So I want to talk about up-leveling this yet again. So I've been talking about um, using MDB in more and more automated and programmatic situations, so I want to talk about Thoth. Thoth is a service that, a uh, system really, that uh, Brian Cantrell built, and I call it as debugging the cloud. What this basically is is that uh, on a periodic basis, which I think is hourly, any core dumps from any core dumps and crash dumps from joint services get uploaded into our object store. Those get automatically unpacked, and a certain set of automatic analyzers are run on those as well. So we have analyzers that take a look at the core dump and pull out, for example, the time of the dump, the server that the dump uh, happened on, the SMF fMRI, which is a which is a useful proxy for the component for us. Um, the SMF fMRI is is the name of the ser the SMF service that that process belonged to, which for us almost always indicates the component and therefore the owner, which is a really useful thing to have as a first class thing. And it also keeps track of tickets. So engineers can query dumps by any of this metadata, and then engineers can also write analyzers that classify these dumps automatically. So the idea here, which is almost fully fleshed out, is when, so when software crashes in production, the, the node program crashes, generates a core file that gets uploaded into Manta, the basic pieces of, the, of metadata are pulled out automatically from that, and then a bunch of analyzers are run for known issues, and we can automatically classify that as a known bug if we already have it. And actually, literally almost all of that already works. Uh, the, it's still a manual process of, of that very last step of running, okay, is this is this, this particular ticket? Um, but the rest of that actually is already done, which is pretty cool. So I'm just gonna demo that, because that I think will help explain a lot of this. So the first, the classic thing, the the first thing you would do is let's look at core dumps that have been generated in the last 12 hours in the joint cloud. I'm not sure if this is actually just our service. Is this just our services? Uh, I don't know why it's taking that long. My, my network might have been asleep. MDB dumped core. That's awesome. MDB dumped core in the last couple of hours. Um, so I just did an LS query of the last 12 hours. I can also do like a report query. So let's look at the last, say, seven days. And let's look by properties.fmri. You mean like an on-prem Manta? Yeah. It could. Yeah. yeah.
that's actually all you need, right? All right, I just want to demo a couple other things. Um, so thought debug is kind of interesting. So we take this one dump, we can thought debug that. And what this is actually doing is this is using our jobs functionality to create an interactive shell on the storage server that is hosting this, which is kind of crazy, again. So what, what we're doing is we've uploaded this file into the object store, and then we're wrapping a container around that file and dropping a shell in there that's connected to your shell over here, which of course is for some reason taking a while to set up, because I'm demoing it, obviously. Um, there we go. Thanks, Josh. Um, and so we're, we're, what's important here is that crash dumps can be extremely large. So you don't want to have to pull it down, and you need to have an environment set up that actually has all the tools you need. It's a much, much easier to actually just log into the box that has it there. And the way Manta works, that's actually totally safe. I can do it rm minus rf of slash star here. I could try and reboot this container, and it's going to be totally fine. I mean, my job won't work, but that's because I, I killed it. Um, but Manta will be totally fine with that. So this is MDB dying. I actually know what this is. This was me practicing the demo. <laughs> and discovering that if you load, this, load our V8 debugger module with a different name, MDB still tries to load it and it blows an assertion on the way up, I think. I think that's what this is. Yeah, this is in V8.so. Awesome. All right, so that's my bug. Oh, yeah, sorry. Um, I'm gonna, I'll do that. Over here. Um, so as an example of one of the analyzers that we run that's not one of the ticket ones, I told you we pull out the fMRI. Another that's like slightly more sophisticated is we use MDB minus E with, um, with some knowledge, with the, with the V8 module to pull out the exception that caused the JavaScript program to crash. And that's pulled out into metadata so that you can query on just that without having to actually like log into the thing or run a compute job. And these are just some stats from, from the last 90 days when I was running this a few days ago. Um, Oh, right, yeah, that, uh, I'll grab that after. <laughs> okay, uh, quick notes on some ongoing and future work. Um, Patrick mentioned walking stacks without frame pointers. I explained that pretty much thoroughly. Um, that is at least as done as a hackathon project, so it's getting there, but it's not quite ready yet. And I already showed printing objects using dwarf instead of CTF, which is pretty cool. We'd love to see bang, bang. Um, we've also talked about better, better programmatic interfaces, particularly for something like Thoth. It would be useful if there was a more library-like interface to MDB, where you're not actually like launching the MDB program and having it take over everything, which is what it does, about the terminal and all, all kinds of details about the process itself. It would also be nice, it would be interesting, I should say, and I don't think this is fully fleshed out, if it were more scriptable, like say with something like a Lua or a JavaScript. If you were able to, for example, Write, write little algorithms on the JavaScript heap in a language like JavaScript or Lua, rather than having to implement all that in C, which would be kind of interesting. We played around with dmods embedded into binaries so that, the, so that, say, Node could embed its own debugger module in the binary that MDB would pull out. There's a security issue associated with that, which is if someone gives you a core dump and you open it in MDB, then it's just like running whatever code they have in there. So that's why it's off, but it's definitely possible, and it would be interesting if that could just be made explicit or you use signed binaries or something like that. And the last thing I want to talk about is that um, I think there's a lot of demand for people wanting to learn better how to use MDB. And there's something for Dtrace called the Dtrace Bootcamp, which if you haven't seen is really awesome. It's a, it's a slide deck that goes through a lot of exercises for playing with Dtrace. I, think, I tried to do something similar for MDB, but I found that Dtrace is a little bit easier in this way because you can point Dtrace at a system and just sort of play with what you see. You see a whole bunch of things happening and you say, oh, what's that? With MDB, you're almost always looking at a specific program and you're looking at the internals of that program and it's hard to, to just instantly start asking questions that make any sense without already knowing what the program is or what it's supposed to do or having the source code or something like that. But I'm really interested in doing this and if people have suggested content in terms of either like I wish I knew how to do this with MDB or um, I know how to do this with MDB that a lot of people don't seem to know, that's really useful and if you have ideas for solving the problem I just described, maybe a simple program that would make a good template for having this kind of boot camp, I'd be really interested in doing that. And if anyone wants to work on that, that would also be great. Um, in, in summary, MDB is great. <laughs> Thank you.